A conceit is not like conceited. A conceit is a comparison of two wildly dissimilar things. Like, but the metaphysical poets, they make these conceits and they're ingenious. And they make them work somehow. They, they combine the world of metaphysics with the subject of their poetry. And by comparing those two things, they really glean all kinds of new meaning. So you can, at least just from that, you can see why I would say this is juicy material for an essay. It's very much more, there's you know, literary writing. As you can see, these are the words. But for every line of poetry, there's this, have this huge subtext beneath it. Metaphors and innuendos and allusions, logical progressions that, you know, it's just all this meaning lurking beneath the surface. And that's a lot of fun if you want to write about it in an essay because there's much red meat there for you to, for you to grab a hold of. So let's talk about John Donne first. Uh, this is 17th, early 17th century England, and this is the time when really the, really the Puritan, the Puritan revolt was kind of really getting started. Okay, now, John Donne was really religious when he was young, but then he had this middle part of his life where he was a young, he was, he was a hellraiser, he was, um, and he, he kind of moved away from religion during the middle time of his life, and that's when he wrote these poems. Then later on in his life, he had another kind of a awakening and became super ultra religious and stopped writing this kind of stuff and just wrote holy sonnets, you know, uh, praise to God. What does the word lascivious mean? Lascivious. You know, you know those people that like the boundaries here and they're just like, ah, blah, 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 no, dancing over the, I think this is him. He's lascivious. And so in the middle part of his life, we're going to see. Um, all right. Let's read Valediction for Bidding. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go. Whilst some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes down. And some say, no. So let us melt and make no noise. Nor tear floods, nor sigh tempests move toward profanation of our joys to tell the laity of our love. Moving of the earth brings calms and fears. Men reckon what it did and what it meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though great or far, is innocent. Dull, sublunary, lovers, love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit those things which elemented it. But we, by a love so much refined, that ourselves know not what it is, enter assured of the mind, care less, eyes, lips, hands, to miss, Two souls, therefore, which are one. Though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness feet. If they be two, they are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move doth if the other do. And though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as that comes home. Such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run thy firmness makes my circle just, and makes me end where I begun. All right. Now, ladies, you're in a ball. Oh, Starbucks. 
I don't know. I know I'm a nerd. I know that I'm a little, I'm a little bit over over feeler, I guess. But if a man, and I'm not gay, but if a man came to me and whispered this in my ear in a bar, I'd be like, what, yeah, you got me, buddy. What, what's up, man? You know, I like it. You guys may not like it, but I like it. I think it's spectacularly fabulous. Now it does go too far at times, but that's done. Um, let's take it. It's a little bit overboard, I know, but let's talk about it. Let's go. As virtuous men pass mildly away. And whisper to their souls to go. Have you ever tried, had to leave somebody? This is about a valediction for bidding morning. Well, I'm, I need to leave. I gotta go. In, in real life, this is uh, between he and his wife, and he was going on a diplomatic mission. He'd be gone for, I think, it was six months to a year, something like that. And he wrote this to say, don't be sad. Don't, don't cry. Don't mourn. This, this, this farewell forbids mourning. As virtuous men, pass mildly and whisper to their souls to go. The virtuous men would be like the best among us, wise, enlightened people, the top, right? And when they have to go, they pass mildly, quietly. Into death. So like, so like, um, this all has multiple meanings. So like, here we go. It's almost like death. This is the first conceit of the whole, of the poem. Us leaving together, you might think it's like death. I mean, we're parting in this way, but it's not. It's not like death. Look, virtuous men at their death time, at their death, they pass mildly away, you know, with not a, not a ruckus. And they tell their souls, they're like, Okay, it's time to go now. You have to go. Or you could take it into the uh, empirical sense, and like the best people among us, when you have to leave, you have to steel yourself against it and tell yourself it's not. You know, you have to go. You have to do it. If it's forever, right? Well, you have to. But if you're coming back, I'll be back. I'll be back. Whilst some of their sad friends, now this is back to the death theme. Though, whilst some of their sad friends do say the breath goes down. And some say, no. Yeah, this reminds me very much of an Emily Dickinson poem that's, uh, I heard a fly buzz when I died. And uh, just without getting into that, I don't know if you've ever been in a room with somebody who's dying. You know, you're there for them to die. I've done it four or five times, and it's, it's terrible. But there's the, it's weird. It's one of the most strange places with a strange tone it's one of the weirdest things ever and horrible and, and sad but like pretty much it does you know it, it takes a lot for a person to die i mean you think that it would be just like oh i'm walking oh and you have a heart attack and just fall down and maybe that happens sometimes but not in my experience it takes a long it, it takes a lot to kill a person it does and it's pretty agonizing and so when you were watching it, you're usually there with a bunch of relatives. You don't want to talk about football or poetry. I mean, what, what is the appropriate discussion? Not much. So it's very quiet. And if, you're with, if you are where there's monitors and the heart and all that, you're kind of watching that and just waiting. And everybody's waiting for the same thing because death is the great mystery to all of us, right? Everybody's waiting for the moment of death. You know, uh, now she just died. That was it. You know, it's a sad time. But by that time, you've already cried. You've already cried so much that you, you cried your eyes out. And now you're just, it's just quiet. It's just this. And Emily Dickinson calls it a silence like the heaves between the storm. And it's uh, like when you have that thunder that really just a lightning strike just out of nowhere and right there there's this silent this moment it's an ominous silence okay some of his sad friends were waiting for the moment of death said the breath goes now they're waiting for that last moment and some say no all right 
let us melt and make no noise. Oh gosh, you guys. When you're in a really hot and heavy relationship and you're in love, that's what it kind of feels like. It feels like you're melting into each other. It's an infusion. It's just a, it's a, it's a unity. It really is. You start finishing each other's sentences and it gets weird, you know. You don't want to see anybody else. You just stay locked up in your house watching Grey's Anatomy reruns for weeks on end and ordering pizza. And you just melt into one another. And at times, it can really feel like you're almost one person. It's just so close. The closeness of it is, okay, so let us melt. Let us melt then. And make no noise. Just like the dying pass mildly away. It would be, um, I'm going to have an echo here. So, like, I forgot her name, and I apologize, but, but um, you know how the English are just very... Oh, blimey, I should be having tea around the piazza this evening with my best silverware. Winston, she shall be bringing me napkins now. Very, just almost like painfully proper. Oh, well, I, my necktie is just a little bit crooked today. That's the idea, anyway. When they were executing people way back, and, you know, it's talking about Renaissance, we're talking about... Um, Mad when it, yeah, talking about Henry VIII's time. You know, there was this, and even Queen Elizabeth, there's this, you know, you go to your death with gallantry and honor. Flip off your cloak for king and country. You put your head over the block, and, you know. That's how an Englishman does it. But finally, I forgot her name, I'm sorry. Finally, they were executing this one woman. And she just, you know, just like, you know, just, oh. And that was kind of the moment because, because before, when, when you walk to your death, you know, and with all this bravery and gusto, it takes away from the horror of what it is. And the people watching, it was a, it was a jolly good death, you know, like that. Well, here comes this, this woman. She was a royal. I can't remember her name. But, um, you know, just flip it out. And just people just had to really, okay, well, in this kind of thinking, that is vulgar. To make a big deal out of something that you have to do, something painful, something, you know, something that is unavoidable. To make, I don't think that. But um, we shall be like, those virtuous people. And we shall go to this temporary separation with bravery and gusto. And what's more than that, we will melt into each other and make no noise because, and, and no tear floods, all right? So what is that? It'd be a hyperbole, exaggeration to extreme degree. You know, a, a flood is not tears. A flood is like Hurricane Katrina, that's a flood. Flash flood, there's a flood, not tears. I mean, how many of you ever been like, oh God, there's a flood here, man, it's just all flood. So that is hyperbole, but it's also kind of a conceit. Your tears are a flood, but let's not let them be. No tear floods, nor sigh tempest smooth. So, you know, the idea is if you are, if you're in mourning or depressed or sad, and you go, oh, you know, you're, mo you're moaning and sighing. Don't let your sighs create a tempest out there. Hang on, I got a problem here. Don't let your, don't let your sighs create a tempest. In fact, we need to be very quiet because the love that we have is so pure and so true, and so real. So it's, it's golden, it's, it's ethereal. There's no words for it. It's so pure and perfect that the laity, all those dirty, filthy, uneducated, unlettered, poor, 
serfs and farmers and beggars and shopkeepers and all that lower class bunch of trash. Of course, I don't think that, but that's the laity. Average people. If, if they, they're so corrupted, polluted, that even for them to hear of our love by you making, oh, you know, making a big, even for them to hear it would, would profane our love in some way. It would, it would hurt it in a way. It would infect it, our love. So just be quiet. we got to keep this on the DL because it's so true. We don't want all of them getting hurt. Okay. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. Now this is moving of the earth. What do you think that is? Moving of the earth. What you think, man? You know, really, people didn't know what earthquakes were. And just imagine that. Imagine just being living somewhere where there's earthquakes and you are, you know, you're just a regular old medieval type of person and the earth begins to shake. And what do you think? It's got to be God or some evil spirit really pissed off, right? I mean, what would you think? It's just like, oh, what is this? I've never been in an earthquake personally. I'd probably be freaked out today. And I know what they are. But in, these time, in this time period, it was unclear. They didn't know plate tectonics. And so, moving of the earth brings harms and fears. It brings down buildings and makes everybody freak out and scared and impending doom. People think of it, they, they, I wonder what the heck that was, and what did it mean? What? But, trepidation of the spears. Now, trepidation is like a trembling. It's like a trembling. So, I don't know if you know about this or not, but you go outside, go to Zilker Park tonight, put down a blanket, lay down on the grass, look up at the sky, and you see stars. If you had a camera and you opened the shutter, you would see that those stars, all of them, start at the east and go over in a smooth arc like clockwork. Every night it never changes. Right? If you're there long enough, you'll see. Okay. All of the stars except a few. And every now and then, on the right and the best, on the perfect conditions, you would be watching and some of these brighter stars would come over and then they would stop and then reverse and go back the other way and then stop and then continue on their journey. What's that mean? I don't reckon I know what that means. So they're not stars, they're planets, they're planets. And it's called retrograde motion, right? Retrograde motion. And so the idea is that you're sitting there and you, okay, here's the sun. Here is the earth going around the sun. And let's just say here's Mars out here. Well, there could be a scenario where the earth passes Mars or vice versa. And that makes it appear as if the planet or star stopped. So this, it just happens with planets. Stopped, turned around, and then continued. And that's where the actual word planet comes from, wonders, from Greek, wonders. Because they wonder, and say, wow, there's this other thing, and it's called procession of the equinoxes. Every year you look at the equinox at the, where the sun is rising, and the sun will rise into a specific constellation. Right? So, but if you stood there long enough, and I mean 10 years, 15 years, you would notice that every year on that same day, it just rises just a little smidgy off, you know, and it's a little different. It's true. And so that's what it means that we are in the dawning of the age of Aquarius. 
So Aquarius is, is next. So, um, and all that has to do with astrology. Uh, what causes the precession of the equinoxes is the wobble of the earth. Just a little slight wobble, and that just causes that every year for it to progress like that. So what he's trying to say here is that the earth quakes. It freaks people out. And buildings come down because of it. That's bad. But the, the trepidation of the spheres... He's talking about retrograde motion, but it could also be, you know, these other un, not understood phenomenon of astronomy. The trepidation of the spheres, it's harmless. It's harmless. Although a much bigger issue, sure. I mean, something could be causing this ground to shake. It's probably a volcano or something. Like but how, how, what in the name of Thor's hammer? Is that? But yet, it's innocent. It does nothing, right? So check out the check out the incredible interplay that's going on here. Earthquakes are of the earth. Astronomy, astro, whatever is of the ethereal you know, sort of space. I guess if God is any one of those two places, it's right. So there's a famous, famous, famous painting of Plato and Aristotle coming out of the Academy in Greece. And uh, you have to understand Plato and Aristotle, but Aristotle is pointing to the ground, and Plato is pointing to the sky. So Plato is called an idealist, and he truly believed, this was his philosophy, he believed that God is, well, and then, and then the Catholic uh, Church got a hold of it and continued to cut Catholic Church got a hold of Aristotle, it's not Plato, but Plato was an idealist. And that's not like good things are going to happen, no. He believes that there is a realm out there somewhere in the universe that is a realm of perfection. Every circle on the planet, I don't have a circle, yeah, I have a little, oh, yeah, here's a circle. Look, I mean, it is a circle, right? But is it perfect? No. I mean, you know, there's guys with little imperfections, a little bit wobbly. You know. Every circle on the planet is imper imperfect. But there's a place out there because God is perfect and all-powerful and all-knowing and omniscient and all that. And God would not create an imperfect universe. Just wouldn't. Couldn't, maybe. Just wouldn't. So there's a realm of perfection out there. And he's called an idealist. And so when they say platonic love, it means without sex, right? But that's really what it means. It means the perfect idea of, of love without intrusion of the flesh and the appetites, right? So check it out. The earth shakes, scary as hell, and stuff really happens, bad stuff. But all of that happens, and it's crazier by far, but nothing bad happens. It's innocent. Right? So the, how does that interplay in the poem? Well, he's going to say, he's going to try to make this connection between flesh, the fleshes of this earth, you know, the fleshes of the appetites, the fleshes of sin and sex and lust. And, but the ethereal plane above us, that's where our love comes from, from that world of perfection. Right? Earthquakes, that's those other people's love, but ours. And then he says this, he says, dull, sublunary lovers, love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit those things which elemental. Aristotle had a philosophy that the Catholic Church then picked up that everything above the moon is perfect. Perfect circles, perfect spheres, perfect all bodies, uh, no, no evil or imperfection at all. Just under the level of the moon is imperfect. Anybody know why? Because of the original sin in the Garden of Eden. Because Eve reached out and took that apple and then went and conned Adam into eating it. I mean, the dude is innocent. He was just sitting there in his loincloth or whatever while he was naked, you know. 
under a tree pontificating, and here comes evil, and you're giving me my apple and ruining the whole world and the universe and everything else. I'm, of course, I'm joking, but that is the that is literally the belief, and especially Puritans, they believed in original sin big time. So, when Eve, Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, it threw this world into imperfection, and the earth became an evil, sinful, wicked place, all the way up to just below the moon. Yeah, and then presumably when Jesus comes back under their thinking, then he'll set it all right again. So Galileo came through with his telescope, and he said, he went to the cardinals. This is a real true story. He went to the cardinals, and he said, look through my telescope. You know, can't you see those on the moon? This is the moon. You know, can't you see all those craters and valleys and ridges and rocks and dirt you know, dunes, and can't you see all those in imperfections? Can't you see all that? And, and look, if you're wrong about the moon being a perfect sphere, then maybe you're wrong about the earth being at the center of the universe, too. And the cardinal famously said, Yes, Galileo, I do see the rocks and the valleys and the ridges and the craters and the canyons. I do see the dunes. But what you don't see is the perfect, spherical, crystalline structure that's invisible and covering it all. And now, Galileo, we are going to burn you at the stake. And they almost did. He barely got out of it, and he ended up being under house arrest for the rest of his life. So they got him anyway. But as, he left, as Galileo left his trial, he was heard to say, ah, she moves anyway meaning the earth revolves. But anyway, so when he says dull sublunary lovers, that's what he means. The other lovers, other people, lovers that are, they are representative of the people who are below the moon. They are flawed and evil and corrupted, sinful and wicked, and not true, false, not real. And their soul, their soul is sense. Not sense in like a common sense, no, sense like, like a sinful, fleshy pleasure kind of sense. They, they cannot endure a separation because their love depends on physical contact. They're, they're lustful. They're just lustful. It's not real love. They're lusters. They're fornicators. They are, these dull sublunary lovers whose soul is sense cannot admit those things which element in it. But we, but we, by a love so much refined that ourselves know what it is, I'm sorry, that ourselves know not what it is. Uh, it, it, it gets a little corny, you know, like, it's like, a, and it reminds me of a, a Harris, Ed Harris, is that his name? He's a singer. What's his name? I found a girl. What's that really his name? Ed Sheeran. Ed Sheeran. He has this song. It's that one I was just singing. And I like the song okay, but his lyrics suck, I think. He says, we, we were just kids when we fell in love. And then I can't remember the rest, but he was saying, we just felt this feeling, love, and we didn't know what it was. I think that's stupid. You know, it's like, you're walking down the street one day and love hits you. You're like, oh, what, what is that? What is that? Never heard about anything like that before. Strange. Come on. Wake up in the world feeling it or wanting it. But we, with love so much refined as ourselves, we don't know what it is. We don't, we, our love is so true that we can't even, I mean, there's no words for it. There's no way to describe it. It's not describable by these tools. It's ethereal. It's above the moon. It's God. It's godlike. It's true and perfect and real. We are like the trep we are the trepidation of the spheres, not the earthquake. They are the sin the, the flesh. We're the the heavens. Okay. Inter assured of the mind. Care less. We 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 care less for lips, eyes, 
hands. We don't need to touch each other to feel our love because our souls are one. Our two souls, therefore, which are one. Now, it's getting kind of corny up in here, right? But I, I get that, but it's like, you kind of feel that way sometimes. Feel like we're just one soul. I know, I get it. I get it. But melt, one soul, unity, you see the, you see the uh, motif there? Our two souls, which are one. Though I must go, he's going on a trip. Endure not yet a breach. And a breach, and we're back to the bare bodkin again, which is just a chopstick. But anyway, a breach is a separation, a cleaving, a chasm, a cut, a break. He says, endure, I have to go, I do. But endure not a breach. It's not a, it's not a breach, but an, an expansion. It's like, we, we are never disconnected. I don't know what it is, this love. It's in between here. But it is always there. and It always connects us. It never breaks, never falters. It connects us. And so, don't think of parting as a severing. Think of it as an expansion. It just stretches out like. And what is like set up? A, a, a simile, right? Like gold to airy thinness beat. So it's like, you know, gold is an, an inert metal. It doesn't rust. It, I mean, you throw it at the bottom of the ocean, it'd be fine, presumably forever. Um, it's malleable, which means, you know, you can can heat it up and make it into all different types of forms. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really mix well with other elements to make it unstable. It's a, it's a very solid, stable type of, of element. And if you take something and beat on gold, it, it doesn't break the gold. It just stretches it out. So this space between us, it's just an expansion of gold like gold to airy thinness beat. Notice the airy. If you go through here and you start looking, oh, I see it's a motif. Airy, above the moon, ethereal, things like spirit, and they're dull, earthquake, sublunary. See that dichotomy? So we don't have a, bre a breach. We have an expansion. And if, okay, if, 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 if our souls are two, then they're only two in the way that a stiff, and keep that stiff word in your mind, in the way that a stiff compass is two. What is a compass? It's a double bare bodkin. A compass is, you have these in geometry. It's like a, you use them in, to draw circles but also to take measurements on a map, things like that. And it looks like this. I don't know. You can see it. It's like that. It's, it has kind of a hinge at the top. You can change it to different angles, and that allows you to judge different distances on a map. But also they're used to make, to draw circles. Because look, if you just, if you, if you plant one and go around like that, it draws a perfect circle. It's pretty cool. Back to circles again. Oh. And so, if we are two souls, I don't think we are, we're one, but if we are two, we're just, we're just two like a, like a compass is. I mean, we're, we're joined up here. Thy soul, your soul, here, is the fixed foot, makes no show. You, you're, you're stable, you're planted, you don't move. Unless the other do. So if I have to go, you move, but only to lean out and hearken after it. So imagine the metaphor. She is the, the kind of the stability of the family. She's rock solid planted at home. She's, that screams fidelity and, and honesty and you know, solid character. He, he has to go. She leans after him, but still always remains firmly planted on the ground at where they should be. And he can roam, but she's always there. 
Ready? Yet when the other far doth roam, and leans, it leans and hearkens after it, and grows erect as that comes home. I think he's saying something good here. Grows erect. Come on, total so sexual innuendo. So look, you go, you're away from your wife six months, a year. Probably one of the first things you're going to be thinking about. Like, hey, uh, right? It's just life. It's just human nature, right? And so I, she leans after him as he's gone, and he grows erect as he comes home. Comes home. Oh, you naughty, naughty monkey, John Dunn, you dirty, dirty boy. See what I mean about lascivious? He's a lascivious script. Okay, and then not only that, then you can go back up to the stiff twin compasses. I, I, I can't find any other reason for that word stiff there. I mean, because they're not stiff. They're, I mean, I guess that is stiff, but stiff would mean it's fixed, but it's not. So anyway, okay, all right, so <laughs> such will thou be to me who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I begun. Wow, thy firmness, oh, okay, no back, erect, st oh, God, oh, God. But also, thy firmness, you're planted, you're um, honorable, true, just. You're, um, you have fidelity. Your firmness, and also, I mean, thy firmness, like your mind, firmness, just let your mind run wild. Firmness of a hug. And makes me end where I... Okay, but I do really love this. Thy firmness makes my circle just. Now, let's continue the metaphor. She's the fixed foot. He is the one who goes... And if you're drawing a circle, he's the one doing the drawing. It is her firmness that makes his circle true. Wow. But also, also... You've heard it a thousand times in movies and everywhere else, and it's like, you know, when, a, when lovers say, you complete me. You complete me. You make my circle complete. Whatever it is that I'm lacking in my soul, in my life, you, you, you fill that gap. You, you make it whole. You complete me. Now, is that corny? Sure it is. But it's the second level of this of this uh, metaphor we're seeing here, this conceit. He's drawing a circle. Her firmness makes his circle true. But also, you complete me in my life. And also, if, you're, if we're, he brought sublunary lovers in there, if we're talking about Aristotelian and, and Platonic philosophy, the circle plays a huge role in that. It's part of, it's like the, the, the shape that's, they evoke most times. It can be a metaphor for many things to circle. But in fact, wedding rings, circle. Okay. Gosh. Now, let me hear some voices. Everybody bailed on me. Excuse me. Y'all are like, man, you got me. You got, Sean Phil's got me studying some kind of. Let me hear some voices. Did you like it? I'm not ashamed to say I love it. What about the diction? It's elevated. The diction, you could say the diction is ethereal. It's in the clouds. It uses big words just like their love. Uh, um, oh, imagery. I mean, there's so much imagery in there, you know. You can just pick out tons of them and talk about how that image enhances the meaning. What do you think the meaning is? If there is a meaning, what do you think it is? A 
I mean, my thinking would be that there's different types of love, but real love is heavenly, ethereal, perfect, indescribable, and all others are just faking, putting on airs, you know, just going through the motions because they're sensual lovers. Let's talk about the flea. Let's read it. I'll tell you, I'll give you a heads up first. Under the Catholic tradition during this time, they had a belief, a, de a decree, a doctrine, an edict, that marriage was like mixing your blood and bodily fluids to the point where you really, you kind of become like brother and sister. In a, in the eyes of God, you know, like family. You become family because your blood mixes. And that was another reason why women and young men were told you can't have sex out of wedlock because you, if you go mixing your blood with these other people, then you're defiling it. You're, you, their blood is mixed inside of you too. So you can't show up to your marriage with 18 people in here. So it's a sin. It's a sin to mix blood just as was marriage before, or sex before marriage. So here comes John Dunn. Ah, mark but this flea. And mark in this, how little that which thou deniest me is. Me, it sucked first. And now it sucks thee. And in this flea our two bloods mingled be, Thou knowest that this cannot be said a sin, or shame, or loss of maidenhead. Yet, this enjoys before it woo. A pampered swells with one blood made of two. And this, alas, is more than we would do. Oh, stay. Three lives and one flea spare where we almost may, more than Mary are. This flea is you and I, and his, our marriage bed, and this, our marriage bed, and marriage temple is. Though parents grudge, and you, we are met, and cloistered in, this, in these living walls of jet, Though use make you apt to kill me, let not to that self-murder at it be. And sacrilege, three sons and killing three. Ah, oh, cruel and sudden hast thou since purpled thy nail in blood of innocence? Wherein could this flea guilty be, except in that drop which it sucked from thee? Yet Thou triumphest, and say, This thou findest not thyself more me the weaker now. Tis true. Then, then learn how false fears be, just so much honor when thou yieldest to me will waste as this flees death took from thee. I mean, I don't think I've heard anything like it, you know? So. The conceit is that in marriage, your blood mixes, you become holy in that way. And before marriage, you don't do it. You don't. But wait, this flea jumped on me and bit me, and then jumped on you and bit you too. And in his belly, our blood is mixed. We're married. We're married. We can have sex. We're married. Ladies, is that working for you? For him, okay, you're in a bar, you're, you're fleeing. <laughs> well, it doesn't work for her either. Let me just, I'll make sure I didn't miss anything. And of course, he's such a shyster, I would say. You know, all this, this sucked and sucked and okay, enough said. Yet, uh, and, 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 the, and look, he enjoyed it. The Puritans are saying sex is just for babies, to make babies. Um, he's like, look, in the, in the, he, he, Bit you and bit me, and he enjoyed it too. He enjoyed it. 
And, and, and look, that's way more than we would do. Right? And then, she, uh, this is my favorite part of the whole thing. She takes the flea and seems to cr want to crush it, you know? It's like, oh, 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 don't kill the flea. Don't kill it. She's, oh, stay. Three lives and one flea spare. We're almost made. married. We are. Look, no. Don't kill that flea. We're married there. This flea is you and I. And his and this, our marriage bed and marriage temple is. That flea is our marriage bed and marriage temple. And also the area around them, because he's trying to, okay. Though parents grudge. I know, I know, I know, I know your parents are going to be upset. You know, they told you to be a chaste person. And they'll get very angry. Then, you know, parents, they get a grudge, you know. Um, but in you, we are met. But it's like, I know your parents are going to be upset, but it's done. It's done. We have commingled in the fleet. We're married. Nothing, less, nothing left. You know, it's, just, it's, just, it's just true. We are commingled. We are cloistered in those walls of jet. The flea is jet black. Uh, though you want to kill me by killing the flea, don't add to that sin self-murder, suicide, because you're the flea too. If you kill the flea, you're killing yourself. In fact, you're killing the flea also, so that's three murders. Don't do it. Don't kill it. Don't kill it. She crushes it. He goes, oh, cruel and sudden. Hast thou since purpled thy nail? You have a little bit of the blood that he was talking about on your nail. Uh, you purpled your nail with that flea. And did it, was it the blood of innocence that you killed? And he said, he's going to answer his own question. No, not really. So he, this is a major shift. Stanza two, he's, he's arguing that the Catholic Church is right. You can't commingle your blood, but we have here. And, uh, you know, we've already done it, so what's, what's the big deal? You know? And then in the third stanza, he's totally arguing the opposite point and saying, oh, you know what? It's fine. That was stupid. That whole thing is stupid. That whole commingling thing, that's, it, that's dumb. Where, how could this flea be guilty except in that drop it sucked from thee? You're standing there in a, in a triumph. You killed that flea. It, it seems like it doesn't bother you at all. Like, you know, you just killed another living organism. It doesn't even bother you even in the slightest bit. And you don't find yourself any weaker now. You don't, you know, you're not, there's nothing wrong with you now. You just kill the flea. It's no big deal at all. So, because that was no big deal, also learn how false fears be. A little bit of alliteration there. <laughs> Use your imagination. False fears be. Like this fear that you're worried about, Catholic Church saying, come on. If, if you're feeling no problem with killing this flea, then that other thing is no problem either, you know? Just so much honor. Like the honor, the amount of honor that you lost by killing that flea. Will be more than any honor you'll lose when thou yieldest to me. And you will waste just as much in the world and from your life and your chastity or your uh, your maidenhood, your virtue, you'll lose all, as much of that as you lost by killing that flea. So you're right. The flea doesn't matter. So you see how he... Um, I just think the whole premise of the whole thing is beyond absurd. You know, the, the whole, like, wait. How did you turn a flea into a very articulate um, persuasion to have sex with because that, that's it. That's the conceit, this metaphysical conceit. And, I mean, the two things are not alike at all. They are nothing alike. Except we have three stanzas of manipulative. Look, he's, he's like, he turns on every belief. And it, so he's like, oh, you believe in the Catholic thing and the commingling? Well, then don't. You know, here's the flea, right? And then when she crushes this, oh, well, you must not believe in the Catholic thing. So, since you don't believe it, I was right all along. 
You're right, manipulative, right? But he somehow, uh, this I think is pretty cool. I mean, saying it's cool isn't like it, but I think it's interesting how the middle stanza serves to reinforce the rhetorical strength of the third stanza. Because you, when you're reading the middle stanza, he's like, oh, oh you, I just, I mean, it makes sense, but it's just not, you know, and then you realize how silly that was, and by realizing how silly that was, it makes this persuasion even stronger. 